your friends, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. This is the week that we get to relate to people like us. You know, we are we're skeptics. We have to be shown. We have to see it to believe it. And Jesus here is ready to have his disciples seek him alive, but they're, they're hardly ready for him. The story tells us that they had locked themselves in for a few, out of a few. But the evangelist has a broader audience in mind. That the Gospel of John plainly says that we are blessed if we come to faith without seeing. And those who come to faith will come because of what is written in this book. There's a sermon right there in that alone. But, but let's be honest, we don't come to faith very easily, do we? We only face problems that are right in front of our eyes, literally. And I suppose that's why we fail to solve uh, the intangible things or to connect the dots or why we trip over stuff in the dark. Faith is even harder than, than ordinary things. We want stuff in life that we can actually touch and hold. We expect to see results, don't we? We expect paychecks in our pockets. We want keys to the car out front. We prefer the bird in the hand instead of the two in the bush. We're realists. Well, at least when we take off our 3D glasses and leave the movie theater, we come back to reality. And even if we're good at imagining things, there's only so long that we can continue if we don't see what we want. The frame of reference here, of course, is what the disciples saw and what they failed to see. Most of the men, by the way, did not see Jesus die. They didn't help to bury his body. A stranger had to do that. They went into hiding. Maybe they shuddered when they heard what others told them about his suffering and, and his terrible death. They just couldn't watch. They didn't want to see their hopes and their dreams dash, smashed because their master and their friend was gone. And the women would have to show them where he was buried. And maybe they couldn't be faulted after all. They, you know, like us, were only human. And human beings need to see things. We, we need to have eyewitness accounts to take anything serious. So here John, the storyteller, the evangelist, realizes that we haven't seen Jesus crucified and risen. And like Thomas, the, the, there's a skepticism, a practicality maybe, a realistic bent, you know, that, that, that holds out. Unless I see, unless I touch, I will not believe. Baptists, as you know, Southern Baptists especially, the Baptists don't baptize babies or small children, do they? Mark Twain, the story goes, uh, was once asked by a sincere Baptist, do you believe in infant baptism? And he said, believe it, acted very astonished. I've seen it. <laughs> you know, there is a problem with all that. The, the core issue here is that if we settle only for what we see, we're passing up much of life, or we're missing the things that have to be felt or experienced or lived. You know? I mean, can you see an earthquake? Can you see a bird song? Can you see the flavor of of the spring's fresh strawberries? We can't see happiness, can we? Even when we meet a person who's euphorically happy. We can't see the food that we digest becoming energy inside of our bodies, fueling our muscles. We can't see the thoughts and the fears and anxieties that may be in other people's heads. We can't see the monkeys on their backs, can we? But we can see their lives change for the better when we believe in them and when we offer them anything. It's not what we see, it's what we experience. So it's, it's fair to ask, is my faith and, and my vision limited by what I see, or by even my imagination? Like living in the dark when no one can see and no one can, can shed light on the subject when everything is dark. And some things I just, I can't imagine. I, I think we're limited by our thinking. If, and this is some sage, I don't know who it was that said this, but if you think you can't, you're probably right. Try that one on a second time. If you think you can't, you're probably right. And that's true. I can, I can argue in my own mind. I can say, no way. I can create my own obstacles that way. I can, I, I can plan to lose. I can plan to fail in life. 
if I think I cannot do something, I will never find the way to accomplish it. In 1824, the composer Ludwig van Beethoven wrote his ninth and his final symphony. It's considered by some to be the greatest piece of music ever written. The original score, which is in the Berlin Museum in, in Germany just 10 years ago, was added to the United Nations World Heritage List. It was the first musical score that was ever given that kind of status. The Ninth Symphony takes over one hour to, to perform all four movements. And what's utterly remarkable about that music is that when Beethoven wrote it, note by note on large sheets of paper, he was almost totally deaf. He could not hear. He could not play the piano to see if it sounded right. And the night that it premiered, he conducted the symphony orchestra and this massive chorus with it himself. He received five standing ovations, five, from the audience. And he could not hear their applause. How did he see? How did he visualize? How did he create in his own mind? If he had said, I'm deaf, I can't, he would not have been able to do it. I can, for example, imagine being president of the United States. When I was a little kid, I was not at all like the kid president. If you've seen the YouTube video or, or the news out of the White House in the last couple of days, that's just beyond me. That's one of those things I would say I can't, and, and I'm right. In order to achieve, or to produce, in order to, to, to to get somewhere in life, in order to go anywhere, we have to imagine the possibilities, the results, the, the destination. So what held Thomas back, I suspect, was his lack of imagination. And I wonder that his, his skepticism, his no-can-do, lack of faith, wasn't just you know, true of Thomas, that he gets a bad rap being called Thomas the Doubter. It was true of all of those disciples. I mean, the betrayer, Judas Iscariot, couldn't imagine that the living Jesus was worth more than 30 pieces of silver that, that he got for, for uh, uh, betraying. Simon Peter, the one who denied knowing Jesus, couldn't imagine that it's possible to stand up face to face with your fears and, 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 and stand against hatred or power or violence. So he chickened out. He lied. He hid. He didn't want others to see his cowardice. We have a problem sometimes, too, I think, believing in God's abundance when we're so familiar, uh, familiar with scarcity in our lives. Our experience prompts us to think that, that life itself is some kind of a zero-sum game where, where what, what somebody else gets in life is going to reduce what I get. As long as the, you know, we have this attitude, we are held back by, by our own thinking. As if the world itself was just one cookie jar, and there's only so many cookies in that jar, so if somebody else gets my cookies, I don't get any. Because everybody wants to get something or get ahead, we tell ourselves that we have to get it first and deprive someone else. When I want to get ahead, I have to push forward and, and get there first, or I don't get it at all. Well, that has a, a huge spiritual dimension, doesn't it? What held Thomas and these other disciples back was this lack of trust and imagination in God's power. Here we have this story of Jesus who gave up his life. I mean, these men had walked with him, they, they learned from him, they, they prayed with him, they, they saw what he had done, the ills that he had cured. Yet they're so slow to understand that God's power is not limited by the mathematics of scarcity or, or even greed. They had seen water become wine. They saw him feed 5,000 people with a, a basket full of bread. They'd seen their boat nearly sinking and Jesus walking out to save them. And now they've heard these women who had been weeping suddenly rejoicing that Jesus is alive. It's a lack of imagination, isn't it? To not believe that the creator of all life, the author of life, who called atoms into being and chemicals into, into living creatures, cannot call Jesus to rise from the grave. If we can't see the meaning of God's generosity and God's loving kindness, we might never experience the power of a life, our life, in God's hands. And here, my friends, I think is 
is the real test for, for faith. But the church proclaims eternal life. I mean, we know that phrase is just it echoes in our brains. Not just resuscitated life, like from a near-death experience, a close call, but eternal life. Not just the resurrection of Jesus, but eternal life for us. A skeptic would say that no one has ever seen an eternal life, so how can you believe in it? I mean, the best anybody can do is, you know, maybe a hundred years. I suppose very few, especially fortunate people, have lived 110, even 120 years. But we know that we've never seen an eternal life. So we're skeptics. We've seen death. We've seen its finality. We, we have lived its grief. But there's something enormously true about eternal life that can't be seen. And it's found not in the operating rooms of our hospitals. It's, it's not in the cemeteries. Eternal life, as the church experiences it, is not an afterlife, but it's a life lived so fully, so bravely, so completely, so faithfully, that death can't end it. The grave does not cancel a life lived in Jesus Christ. Amen. In the Gospel of John, the words eternal life appear 17 times. And here's the most arresting thought for me. For John, eternal life begins not when you're dead. Eternal life begins the moment that you believe and you begin to live by the promises of God and, and live in the imagination of what God can do to bring you to life. Eternal life is not an afterlife. It's a different quality of life. It can't be seen. An imagination of, of what has never been before now coming into existence. Although there's more in this gospel, there's a whole additional chapter like an appendix, it seems pretty clear that the original gospel of John must have ended here with this climax, with this remarkable change of heart in Thomas, the change of a mind of a, of a skeptic who comes to great faith. And there is in each of us the desire of Thomas to, to see and touch for ourselves. Yet we are blessed, it says, without sight, without evidence, without props, without anything that we can show for it if we believe in the promises of God. Unless, of course, there is one thing that can be seen. Think about this a minute. If we let others see our faith for themselves, let others see that we are different and that our lives have changed and that we have come to life because of our faith in God's unseen power and grace. They will see for themselves. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life. So for us, our faith and our commitment, that may be the book that others will read. And through that come to faith and find eternal life. Amen? Amen. Amen.